Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching the Salty Sea, and I've got a really fun one today. Um, I did some science. I never do some science, right? Um, or at least it's been a while. So I play this game, this game called War Cry. I roll these dice, the ones you can see on screen right here, and I've been thinking about them a lot lately. So uh, recently I was just kind of chatting away, tapping the keyboard on the uh, War Cry Discord, and someone posted an article that had some pretty wild statistics that at first I kind of had a, it almost created this like panic button in my brain. Like have I been rolling the wrong dice all this time? And then uh, also then afterwards kind of made me feel a little skeptical. Like, wait, can this really be a thing? And then I ended up buying dice anyway. And the whole thing, just a really, a really fascinating little study. So I decided I should, you know, contribute to the literature. I should kind of do my own study, right? Because Dice are a pretty wild little subculture and sub world. You can see tons of incredible bespoke dice out there. This one from Ur Wizards, this set, uh, I think is truly incredible and one of the most beautiful things I've seen in my life of any sort of art, and not just dice, right? Um, and then on the other side, you have these, uh, you know, pretty basic ones that say come in the starter set. So again, you know, this video is going to be a little bit more mainstream useful, but I got uh, in my Warcry starter set, for those who don't know, Warcry is a uh, little skirmish board game, war game that you, uh, you know, have little soldiers that you paint and you, then you basically run them against each other and you roll a lot of dice in the process. And I wondered are my dice crooked? Because there's a lot of research out there, right? And so I thought I'd do some amateur science here. So I'm going to do a uh, fun little sloppy lit review. Uh, again, this is, you know, high level analysis for low level gamers, basically, um, including myself, that includes. So then I'm going to do a somewhat flawed experiment, let's be real. Um, we don't need this to kind of stand up to academic standards here, but I think we can learn a lot. Um, and I certainly learned a lot sort of over the process of doing this. So, and then at the end, I'm going to kind of show some pretty easy solutions to uh, any kind of conclusions I've got here. So first, I think it's relevant to learn how dice are made. Now, uh, there's quite a few sources on the internet around this, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to make dice. I'm going to outline the most common one here. Um, there's a useful link here. I've got it up on the screen. You can also uh, check it out in the links down below. Um, and this is from 2019. It's pretty, pretty recent. And awesomedice.com is a website that sells dice, so they would know. So step one is they use injection molded polymer, just like super hard plastics. And they put it in a machine that's exactly what you see here. Um, there's kind of a hopper, you toss these pellets into it, it they go through these heaters, they come out into this objective mo um, injection mold, and then they plop out as the product on a, um, you know, on this conveyor belt. The other way that's a little less common is big casts, where they basically have molds, but they have like these massive sheets of molds and they put a bunch of them in at a time and then clip them. Either way, after that, step three is to go into a three-stage rock tumbler. Um, the first one, they tumble them to remove blemishes. Then they dip them in paint. Then they tumble them again to remove the paint. And then they tumble them um, with some little fancy grit that polishes them really nicely. So, that's a lot of tumbling. And the tumbling means that they're all smacking against each other and beating each other up a little bit. Each, each time they hit each other, now normally when you're just rolling dice and then tossing them on the board, they're hitting each other, but they're not hitting each other very hard. And, you know, this rock tumbler that you see from National Geographic that I've got on the screen, uh, it wouldn't hit things as hard as an industrial rock tumbler would, but it's still doing it much, much harder, right? It basically has the power to take rough stones and turn them into these um, kind of almost gemstone-like things that you see on the screen, right? So that's the most common way to make dice, and it beats them up quite a bit in the process, uh, but it is very quick and very cheap and very effective. Um, there are 
other ways to make dice, and we'll get to those later. Uh, there's at least two other pretty significant ways to do it that I think are worth talking about. But the vast majority of dice that you get, the, uh, the cheapest dice, they all are made with this method. And I think there's some pretty relevant reads here. So there's a post, I wanted to start with the post that made me kind of panic at first, right? Which is a post on a forum called Daka Daka from 2006. This is a now defunct, maybe it's not defunct, I don't know, maybe there's people who are members. I'm, I'm not a member of it. But a forum where people used to talk about Warhammer. And this guy made his physics class roll a whole bunch of dice a thousand times. So 144,000 total rolls, um, basically 144 dice of various types. And what he found was the Chessex dice and the Games Workshop dice. Now, both of these are fairly low quality, you know, done using um, probably methods that are even pre this method, if it was 2006, right? It might have been a sprue, you know, cast off a sprue and then tumbled. But they were rolling ones 29% of the time, which is wild. Um, and then, now these are the rounded edged ones. Square dice, but with pips, uh, so little grooves cut into the plastic. Those rolled ones 19% of the time, which is still a lot, but not obviously not quite as much. And then casino dice were a perfect 16.67. And because this guy was a physics professor, um, apparently this was not his uh, area of specialty, but he talked with some other folks in his department, and basically there are two forces working on a die at any given time while it's rolling. One is gravity, where you would expect that the heaviest side, the side with the one, would want to come down first. This, the second is centrifugal force, where the heaviest side is actually wanting to maintain its momentum and actually avoid being the bottom side because it's it's as it's coming down it's gaining momentum and then it's wanting to roll at least one more time because it's got so much momentum um, that it's wanting to roll one more time so that would mean that force is basically pulling the ones to being on top because that's when they have the fewest momentum, right? They're, they're, the one, the heaviest side, is on its way coming up and losing momentum as the heaviest side goes up and then settling on that high side. So the way the corners are done, the sort of amount of weight in each one is going to matter whether gravity or centrifugal force are more powerful on a given set of dice. Uh, the way you roll them matters for that as well. but. In the way he was having his uh, class roll it, centrifugal force was much more powerful and the rounded corners of the dice were, were really empowering that centrifugal force and making the ones always come on top because that was the heaviest side of the dice and those were just coming up on top all the time. So I wondered, can I actually use this? Is, can I actually trust this? 29% just seems wild, right? Because people would notice, wouldn't they? So it made me wonder if dice were made differently 16 years ago. If maybe the dice that they were using, uh, the heavy side, the one, and the light side, the six, maybe that was more skewed than it is now. Who knows, right? So I took a look at some other sources. I was curious, what other experiments have people done out there on their dice to see kind of what is rolling what. And I'm most interested in kind of the, the mass produced dice, right? Like these Chessex ones that are on the screen, um, the Games Workshop ones that are, you know, being given a rude gesture on the previous screen, things like that. And I found a few relevant reads. So the first was a really interesting uh, D20 brand comparison. So that website I mentioned earlier, Awesome Dice, they did a fairly comprehensive comparison between uh, Chessex, the one you see on the left here, the red one, and Game Science. This is a company that no longer exists, unfortunately, that made sort of very geometric dice, you can see here, with very sharp corners. And they rolled each one 10,000 times, um, which is pretty incredible. And the results, um, sorry for that typo right there, uh, the geometric game science dice rolled significantly more true, um, much, much more true than the slightly more rounded and also tumbled 
chess six dice. Now, there was a flaw in the game science dice. The place where they had been gotten off of their sprue, so game science dice were actually molded and cast and then uh, not polished or anything, just sort of painted and sent away. Um, the place where the mold was was always on the 14, and it always made it so that um, or sorry, it was on the one that's opposite from the 14. So it always made it so that you were a little less likely to roll 14s because uh, the one on the other side was just uh, very less likely to be on the bottom. But aside from that one number being rolled way less, it was much more even. And the, uh, the tumbled dice was just like wildly different based on different things because when actually sort of balanced and measured, the tumbling process had beaten it up too much and taken it away from true. And so he pointed out that there's actually more of the difference is on the tumbling than on the uh, the pip imbalance. So pips do imbalance a dice on a six-sided dice, but on these d20s, they don't really imbalance it. So in theory, you would think that a d20, you know, because there aren't pips, because every side is fairly similar um, in terms of the weight of the dice, you would expect a d20 to roll much more even. And they found that they did not because of this tumbling process, because of the process of being in a roller with uh, a bunch of other dice beating each other up. They were instead a little bit egg-shaped because each dice is being beaten up in just a different way. And so it creates this non-randomness to the rolls. Now, the non-randomness is random. One d20 that's been tumbled is going to be skewed in a different way than the next d20 that's been tumbled because they're just smacking each other randomly in the machine. It's just that each smack in sort of introduces a flaw to the dice. So the big takeaway from this one is that the tumbling process matters a lot. Uh, they basically they did a really comprehensive study both to how the dice were made and how they rolled, and they really concluded that um, the more geometric, the more sharp the corners, the more more true to shape it was, the more it, it was going to roll well, and that actually you still had a ton of flaws that were beyond just the pips of a d6, for example. I also want to shout out this really beautiful D20 that I found on the internet. I'm going to keep showing a few really beautiful dice, whether they're balanced or not, is uh, regardless and not to the point. The point is that there are some incredible artists out there making dice. So the next, the next read that I dove into and the next piece of this uh, little fun little literature review is the Auto Dice Roller, um, a absolute madman you will see i will put the link down in the description below an absolute madman built a rolling machine <laughs> um, using entirely parts available at the local hardware store apparently and got absolutely industrial with the experiments uh got groups of four dice rolled them each twenty thousand times and this person was only rolling d8s uh because this person was a competitive x-wing Rogue Squadron, or I don't know, X-Wing player. Uh, for those who don't know, that's a um, a game. It's Star Wars themed. It all uses D8s. So the person got the basic dice that come with the game that are the only ones you're supposed to use in the game and wanted to roll them to see how they are, right? And found that of the 40 dice that they tested, only nine of them were actually fair. They were actually random. The rest were all skewed in a pretty significant way, and not only skewed, but he rolled all these dice 20 times, 20,000 times, and found that it actually only took about 1,600 rolls for the bias to be apparent to a statistically significant way. Now, I was really inspired reading that because 20,000 is not doable, but you could roll 1,600 times, right, um, as you'll see. So. This was really interesting to me. The person also tested a bunch of other dice. So uh, he tested some game science dice because he had heard about this study where the game science dice was a lot better. So he found some game science D8s. Again, sadly, game science not still making dice, but found that half of the game science dice were fair. Now, it's only four dice, but you know, two out of four is a pretty interesting amount. He also said that uh, they were more fair later on as almost as if 
the process of rolling them beat down the blemish a little bit uh, that comes on one side of game science dice. Uh, so two of the four game science dice were fair, and so that was a lot better, but still a little unnerving, right? How um, if you buy a pack of four of these dice, two of them are just totally skewed. And again, uh, he was finding like pretty significant statistical differences in terms of what was rolling on these dice. He also then 3D printed some dice and found that three out of four of them were fair. So if you have a good 3D printer, you can print dice apparently that are gonna be pretty good. And uh, he only found one skewed one in the four he tested. Now, I think it really depends on how good your 3D printer is. I would imagine that this person who's able to create an automatic dice tumbler with an automatic reading system, if you can see uh, right down in here, he actually trained a computer to recognize the faces of die. <laughs> if you have all the technical know-how to do that, you probably, your 3D printer is probably pretty good. Let's, <laughs> let's assume that. Um, if you have maybe a lower quality 3D printer, it might be harder to get perfect dice, but it's still, you know, three out of four um, were fair. And so that's a pretty good number there. The interesting thing about that was sort of quote unquote proving that Again, these dice that are further away from the tumbling process are just much better, much more random. Um, the tumbling process just really, really takes the randomness out of dice. It beats them up in very, um, in ways that really skew the way they roll. And this person also found a, a few of the dice were so skewed that you could, um, that you could detect that they were skewed in very few rolls that you could detect they were skewed in only like a hundred rolls or so which is pretty wild and so you would probably if you were gaming with them you would notice you know this dice is like totally totally messed up you would probably notice it pretty quickly and then as a control he used casino dice of course and the casino dice were perfectly fair um, the Daka Daka posts also used casino dice and also found that they were perfectly fair so a, uh, a truly random dice does exist and then he also actually tried some metal dice made by a company called Gravity Dice and found that they were also perfectly random. And again, 20,000 rolls and perfectly random across 20,000 rolls. That's incredibly impressive. So the perfect random dice does exist, but most dice don't get up to that standard. Now, this made me kind of interested in a lot more dice theory. I read a few things. Uh, one pretty useful article is here on the screen. It's down below. Um, kind of this person reviews a lot of dice, found that casino dice, one of the things about them, so they're perfectly random. Their machining process around casino dice is like incredibly maniacal because it actually has to be. There are laws around this. Casinos have known that uh, everything I've, I've been telling you about dice, casinos have known for like decades ages from now um and so there are like really stringent laws about what kind of dice casinos can and can't use and they are actually truly perfectly random the the problem is they uh they require these really bougie felt top tables that casinos use otherwise they chip um they break and that's too bad <laughs> Another thing that's really relevant here is that clear dice make it a lot easier to spot flaws in the dice. Now, that can be the difference between a dice that's maybe not perfectly random, but close enough that you won't notice, to a dice that like you would notice after a few dozen rolls even. Um, and again, I just want to show these incredible sort of space-themed dice from Spellcaster Dice. I mean, just look at that D&D &D set. They're amazing. So. This is kind of a lot of different research, but the most important takeaways, the things that I really learned that were coming across in article after article that I read were uh, really three major pieces. The first is the roundness of the edges of a dice. Um, any flaw that exists in a dice will get magnified the more round the edges are. Because again, if one side of the dice is heavier than the other, it will, again, increase the momentum of the dice as it's coming down. It will decrease the momentum of the dice as it's coming up. It will demand, if it's being rolled in a very spinny way, it will demand to be at the top. If it is rolled in a very droppy way, it will you know, demand to be at the bottom, depending on that. But like round edges do not arrest the, the momentum of the heavy side of the dice. So they basically, 
They also do a lot of kind of, they careen off each other and spin around on the board a lot. Now that looks like randomness because they're spinning and it's exciting on the board, except what's really happening is uh, it's actually giving more opportunities for the heavy side of the dice to find um, where it wants to be on the board. And so uh, this seems to be, other factors are important, but this seems to be the biggest factor by far is the roundness of the edges and the way they magnify any existing flaws um, to just like take all the randomness out of dice. So degree of roundness also matters. Of course, you know, the crisper the edge, the more it stops the momentum of a dice rolling. The, the roundness from tumbling matters compared to the roundness by design. I'll talk a little bit about backgammon dice in a little bit, but, um, you know, roundness from tumbling becomes very egg-shaped roundness, so then it, it's a whole nother ball game, essentially. Um, so then you also have pips and blemishes, so like things on the dice. So grooved pips, for example, do slightly imbalanced dice because regardless of the edges, some sides of the dice are going to be heavier than other sides of the dice because of the grooves that have been drilled into the die. Uh, now this is interesting because <clears throat> the unbalance it gives dice is predictable and the same is true of blemishes. And that's what you see in the Daka Daka study, that's what you see in the study with game science dice, is that these factors create um, very predictable changes to dice numbered dice, so ones that don't have pips but that have uh, numbers engraved in, those are always going to have slightly less systematic bias there with like the pips would because, you know, the six pip side, there's six times as much stuff grooved out of the dice as there is with the one pip side. Uh, numbered dice, sure the one is still got less than the six is, but it's not six times as much less, right? The, the six and the five are probably like two and a half, three times as much stuff engraved out of the dice. So the, the delta between the top and bottom is much smaller. The third thing is tumbling. And this is, the, um, this is the other really big one along with round edges. Basically, tumbling introduces flaws to dice because of them smacking against each other much, much harder than they do when you roll dice. When you roll dice, they do smack against each other. There probably are tiny, tiny microscopic flaws being introduced there, but the tumbling process has them hitting each other at forces that like you just can't even imagine creating with your with your own hands um so it also creates kind of flaws in a random unpredictable manner that might make a dice skewed in a way that it wouldn't seem like it was skewed based on where the pips are because you'll create this kind of egg shapedness or this kind of lopsidedness that is going to actually change not just which side of the dice is heavier, but it would change how it spins and sort of how it rolls across the board. And this is another thing that would get magnified with rounder edges. And of course, tumbling is a process that rounds the edges of a die even more. Cast dice partially solve this problem, right? They have fairly crisp edges. They're not being tumbled. And then machine dice that are like being perfectly measured and cut every time those fully solve the problem so and that can be really interesting so the one the one thing is uh, i'll get to casino dice but that can be uh sort of give and take there the other side of takeaways though and again we have some really beautiful bone dice from creative anachronism i really doubt that they're perfectly random but they are incredibly beautiful the x-wing study said some tumbled dice are biased enough to really really matter like could completely skew competitive games of, you know, and whatever game you want to do, if you're getting competitive with it, some dice could like skew it enough that it's going to matter in almost every game. And some dice wouldn't. With at-home tests, you can also kind of, you can do saltwater baths, things like that, to kind of find out where the skew is to your dice to see if your dice are fairly random or not. Uh, that can be something if you're really concerned with your dice, you can do it without having to roll it a million times. But what I was really interested in is, is this going to matter for casual gaming? Because in competitive X-Wing, I've never seen it done. Apparently, it probably matters a lot. You probably don't roll that many dice, right? But if you're rolling a set of tumbled dice, and this is what, what I decided to test. If you're rolling a set of tumbled dice, in theory, 
it should mitigate the lack of randomness, right? Six unfair dice that are unfair in different ways might appear random as you're rolling them, right? So if there's one dice that 20% of the time it rolls a one, well, if that's the only dice you're rolling, you're going to notice pretty quickly, man, I'm rolling a lot of ones. But if you have a dice that's rolling too many ones, and you have a dice that rolls too many fives, and you have a dice that rolls too many fours, and then you have like three actually random dice that are fair, um, and you're rolling all of them together, you will roll more ones, fours, and fives than you will twos, threes, and sixes. But it would take like tons of, ro I mean, you wouldn't notice really. And so I was interested to see if we take dice that we know based on the literature that that they're not that they're not fair or they're not like legitimately or they're just low quality dice if you take them and you roll them in a bunch of sets uh what's going to happen so if we bring this to kind of the games that i play let's look at what dice actually come with our games well i've gotten in warcraft i've gotten two of these sets and one is the starter set, the other is Red Harvest. They come with slightly different dice. You can see one of them came with the rounded edged. They're probably both tumbled. These have just rounded enough edges that they've probably been tumbled a little bit. But these have extremely round edges. They've probably either been tumbled a lot or they started with round edges and then got tumbled. And now the edges are just so round that the dice just like they roll around like little balls, basically. And so I felt confident saying, we already know from the literature that these dice are just complete trash. They don't roll any, not even do they not roll random, they don't even roll anywhere close to random. It's almost unthinkable that even a quarter of them would be truly random die because, you know, the X-Wing, we know all of the theory of what makes a good random dice. We know... Um, tons of tests that have been done even on this specific dice maker right and so we know that these rounded edge dice should just be awful dice what if we try to find out right we have this sort of maybe there's systematic randomness unrandomness with the pips right because these are pipped dice so for example that five side is going to be significantly lighter than that one side um, you can even see on the rounded edge dice the pips are deeper than they are with these flat edged dice you know it's clearly just a totally different manufacturer uh, the same is true actually with uh, the the insignia which you can see is kind of a slightly different not as heavy gouge in the in the more square dice so the question is with these trash dice which we know each one is probably significantly skewed uh will we notice so i decided so i have 17 of the really low quality dice obviously there's three dice on the page that are actually pretty good and then there's three dice on the page that we know are total trash based on everything that i've just read out to you um, based on kind of the theory of how dice creation works and dice randomness works now we also know from the x-wing study that on any given dice 1600 rolls was plenty in order to find out if they're skewed or not uh, now they rolled them 20,000 times just because because why not but all of the all of the trends were very clearly visible in the first 1600 rolls was something that um that they pointed out so 17 dice uh it's 17 instead of 18 that actually came in the original starter set only because i lost one it happens i rolled all of them at once so in a big group 100 times and that simulates sort of a big war game like warhammer you know, a lot of games you'll roll like big sets of 10, 15, 20 dice all at once. And so there's a few things going on here. One is uh, casinos. When you roll casino dice, your dice has to hit both the floor and one of the walls to count. Um, because dice rolled in a vacuum are always going to be less random than die that bounces off a bunch of other stuff. In theory, rolling 17 dice they should all kind of bounce off each other, right? And so that should make them actually a little bit more random than they would be if you rolled them all alone. So again, we're hoping here that we won't notice anything off in these 1700 rolls, which have been proven to be enough to tell if a dice is broken or not. Uh, in Warcry, we roll six dice at a time. So I also did 
two separate tests of rolling a set of six dice 100 times. And in theory, variants might be a little bit more detectable with fewer dice in the set. They're not bouncing off each other as much. And so, you know, who knows? So after the 17 dice test, I take the six black ones from the starter set and the six red ones. I don't do the brown ones because I lost one. Um, and I roll each one 100 times as a set. And I got some interesting results. So I'll start with rolling them all together, 1,700 dice. Uh, they were a little light on sixes. And they were a little heavy on twos and fours. But not enough to be significant, right? The p-value is 0 0.303. Again, not enough to be significant. That is enough to be a little fishy, right? There's like a 30% chance if you were rolling perfectly random casino dice. A little less than one in three of the times, you would get results that were at least this wonky. So most of the time, they'd be much more accurate, much or like much more sort of closely grouped on the expected value. But every once in a while, in a group of 700 rolls, you would get something this wonky. So I would say if these were your dice and you were rolling them in big groups of 17 all at a time, um, you can see here my you know experimental design of just rolling them in this little cardboard box here. The, these low quality dice, you would you would bemoan your luck a little bit, right? You rolled 19 fewer sixes than you wanted to. You kept rolling twos, right? You rolled a uh, high 20s to more twos than you wanted to. But it's not that off. I think if if this were your die, your set of dice, and you were rolling them a lot, uh, you wouldn't notice. The only the only exception would be if you were playing a Warhammer army that uh, had exploding sixes. Now, for those who don't play Warhammer, that just means, um, say, if you roll a six, it deals twice as much good stuff, or it gives you twice as many things as uh, if you don't roll a six. Uh, if you were rolling an army that sort of re relies on those, then you might really notice because, you know, the, the effect on your total damage output would be much lower. But otherwise, I think you could do this and, and it would be fine. Results get interesting though when we move to smaller sets. I rolled the six red die a hundred times, then the six black die. So this is 1200 total rolls to add to my 1700 total rolls that I did in the previous test. And the results become a lot more volatile by color. A slight skew in the ratio of flawed dice, it becomes really glaringly obvious as you travel down, right? So let's think of it, I already said kind of the case in which you have a set of unbalanced dice where one is unbalanced on ones, one's on fours, one's on fives, right? And that's, they kind of mess each other up, they, they, they hide each other's variants. Uh, well, that's a lot less achievable with fewer dice. And so you saw the sixes actually had a more random looking p-value than when I had rolled the whole group of, um, of 17 dice. I think most gamers could use my red dice and never notice the slight reduction in sixes that you see here. Now again, it's very interesting to me that in every single test there were fewer sixes. There is definitely something up with uh, the starter set dice in general in terms of rolling fewer sixes than you would expect. However, if you look at the black dice, I don't think anyone could roll, could play with those black dice and not start to notice that they were not rolling sixes. I mean, look, 600 rolls and they only rolled 65 sixes. That is wild. And the chances of that happening are like, extremely low. This uh, chi-squared value is very significant. Um, I think this is at better than 1% likelihood of, of randomness actually producing this result, or sorry, like less than, I think it's like 1% to 2% likelihood of randomness actually producing this result. So this is extremely skewed. And I don't think that it's possible to roll these dice without being like, there is something absolutely wrong here. And so I thought that was really interesting because it meant that, again, for Warhammer, for games where you roll a ton of dice, where you're rolling sets of 15 dice at once, 20 dice at once, I really think it's probably fine to use low quality dice, right? But for War Cry, where you only roll six dice at once, for maybe some other games where you roll even fewer, 
I don't think I would chance it with low quality dice. Now I do want to talk about potential flaws in the method. One being I wasn't using dice as beautiful as these uh, wooden seagull dice. At least that's the dice maker's name. Now wooden dice probably aren't very random, but they do look good. Now. The first question is, should I have made a more stringent metric for what a roll is, right? Should I have, like, had a very calculated, we're doing a certain thing? And I'm saying absolutely not, because the whole point of this is to simulate casual gaming, where one time you might roll it like this, one time you might roll it like this. There's a ton of different ways to roll dice. Everyone rolls differently. So having a standard for what a roll is felt, to me, counter to the spirit of the exercise. Now I know it makes it less scientific. You don't have to tell me that. However, I really think the whole point of this is to find out if skewed dice, because we know these dice are skewed because we know the theory of what skews dice applies to these dice. We know they're skewed even though we haven't tested them. Should, you know, will we detect that in casual gaming? That's why I didn't sort of create a string, stringent metric for what a roll is. Uh, the other question being, should I have tested each die individually to see if it was flawed and then rolled them all together? Uh, probably. Yeah, probably. But I don't have those resources. Um, I am just a humble YouTuber. I can't be just like spending seven weeks just like testing each of these 17 dice by hand. I can't go and, you know, spend $300 at the hardware store with the price of lumber right now, Jesus. Um, when that auto dice tester was built. Uh, you didn't have to pay modern prices for those for those two by fours that he made it out of. I'll tell you that much. Um, oh my god, I can't believe I'm going this. Yeah, that, that wood now would cost at least 10 times what it cost back then. Um, so it's also, I think, only kind of mildly useful to do so. We know from previous studies, round edged pip dice are incredibly skewed. The, even the X-Wing study that found that 9 out of 40 dice were fair, that was using dice that were um, still tumbled and stuff, but had much crisper edges than these, these round-edged pip dice. And again, we're specifically wanting to find out if variance is detectable to the casual gamer, so it'd be a person who does not know the specific flaws of their specific dice. Will they notice them just through gaming? It's also interesting to note, would it be worth comparing these dice to some other dice sets? And my answer would be absolutely. You know, maybe there's a something non-random about how I pick the dice up, look at them, shake them around, and then do it, and I'm cursing myself out of sixes, and I would just never roll sixes on any dice. Sure, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, you know, I read Cryptonomicon. I know how these things work. <laughs> But again, resources are an issue. There's also uh, questions about sample size. I think anyone could say, you know, you're just a human rolling dice. What's your sample size? The thing is, though, 2,900 dice rolls. That's how many I did. 2,900. Uh, that's a lot of dice rolls. 100 per dice. Another 100 again for 12 out of the 17 dice, the ones that I did in multiple tests. Um, again, we have a lot of evidence to say that 1600 is all you need to find out if a dice is skewed. I think it's absolutely enough. 2900 rolls is absolutely enough to evaluate whether set rolling is going to be detectable by the casual gamer. Again, we're looking at the fact that the casual gamer is not going to be rolling tens of thousands of dice. The casual gamer over the course of a tournament is probably going to roll about a thousand dice right and so i think it's you know worth testing within the limits of the casual gamer there uh so finally just to sum up all the conclusions one <laughs> these north foundry dice are absolutely gorgeous um just look at them look at the little case that comes with them look at the little the way they've oh, it's all beautiful. All right, my Warcry starter set dice, on the other hand, I think it's pretty clear that there's something systematic about them that makes them roll fewer sixes. We could definitely get into a sort of dice by dice comparison using the auto roller to find out exactly how much it is. But so, for example, we don't know is this random flaws tumbling, so just some of them randomly have fewer sixes, like maybe there's three blacks that just roll fewer sixes, and that's why the black test 
was just really wild how few sixes you rolled. But then when there were all 17 of them, it was less wild, of course. It was still a little fishy, but a lot less intense. Um, maybe that's what it was. Or maybe it's systematic flaws. Maybe it's the symbol and the pips are actually making it so fewer sixes come up. It felt systematic to me, rolling 3,000 dice, but as much as I said in the last slide that 3,000 is plenty, or just short of 3,000 is plenty, uh, I don't think I have the data to say for certain whether it's systematic or random flaws uh, from tumbling. Uh, I think we would need to test multiple starter sets. If you did the, you know, my exact test, um, but hopefully with 18 dice instead of 17, but if you did my exact test, but on someone else's starter set dice, maybe if you had, once you had done that with to three different starter sets of dice, uh, then I think that you could actually make some claims there. Uh, but for me, I don't think you could. Uh, the other thing is, I'm curious if the Red Harvest dice, the ones with the slightly crisper edges, would work better. Um, there's a lot of reasons to think so, because of the much crisper edges. You could see that the pips were not drilled as deep on those ones. So there's a lot of reasons to think that those would be significantly more fair dice. But I think a lot, you know, more research would be needed. I'm not going to do that research because, ugh, this was exhausting. But more research would be needed. Um, the other conclusion, rolling as a set does in fact make randomness harder to detect. So if you are a Warhammer player and you do not play competitively, rolling with cheap dice is fine, right? If you're rolling with a big set of 30 Chessex dice in your Warhammer games, that's fine, you know? Anything where you're rolling 12 or more dice at once, it's fine to have low quality dice. It really is. However, small sets can be much more sensitive to dice flaws. I will never use my starter set dice again. I will never use any rounded dice, rounded edged dice again for my favorite game, which is Warcry, because it's pretty clear that six dice, you know, sometimes, like with my red ones, you can have a pretty fair set of dice. Those red dice from the starter set, maybe I should maybe play with them again sometime because they seem pretty fair. But the black ones, totally, totally borked, right? So um, I think that I'm done personally using cheap dice for Warcry because they're very detectable when you roll just six at a time. So what can we do? I went out and I looked at a bunch of different solutions at a bunch of different price points. And the first one are basically the old gaming solutions. Um, now I'm just going to say this video is not sponsored. Uh, none of the companies I'm going to talk about, none of the companies of beautiful dice that I've shown already, um, you know, these wooden incredible dice, wooden seagull. I've never talked to the person behind it. I have no idea what their name even is. Um, you know, I have no connection to any of these companies. So the first one, the classic one, is casino dice. Now, first, you have to use casino grade dice, not actual casino dice, because they drill a little hole through the serial numbers um, that are on the six, and then it goes through the center of the one. And so apparently, after they've been used, they roll, um, they roll skewed, and they do this so that you can't take old casino dice that have been discarded, alter them very slightly, and then reintroduce them to the casino, and then trick a dealer into letting you play with them, and then you know that you've altered them slightly to make them skewed and play a certain way, uh, and then you bet on that and you m make millions of dollars. Can't do that. They drill the hole, doesn't work, and it makes it so it doesn't really work for gaming. So um, you get these beautiful, like, almost memorabilia type casino dice that would work okay for gaming, but are going to roll a little skewed because of the hole they've drilled in them. Um, don't use those ones. Use casino grade dice that come with serial numbers. Um, these are perfectly balanced. All of the tests that I read about that used casino dice as a control, they all found that they were rolling 16.67% on every single dice face. I think that that's incredible that they've managed to achieve that with these. Um, now, the one thing to note, like I just mentioned very briefly, they're very fragile. 
Um, you have to use a quality felt dice mat, a very soft felt dice mat. Uh, casinos get rid of their dice after just eight hours of gaming um, because that's how much, you know, that's how fragile they are is they start to get skewed after just those rolls. Um, people who roll them on just like wooden tabletops, if you get them for D&D or something, uh, they are going to chip within very, very few rolls is what every review has said about casino dice. So you need a very soft play mat in order to roll them. Um, but you can get them for a reasonable price. I mean, $15 for five of them is expensive. It's much more expensive than your average plastic dice, but it's a lot cheaper than a lot of the really foolproof options that are out there. Um, so they are kind of affordable as long as you have the setup to protect them and to kind of cherish them and keep them safe. Uh, then you can have a perfectly random set of dice uh, for, you know, a somewhat reasonable price. Um, one note, they are a bit big. They're 19 millimeters. Uh, the standard dice size that comes with every game, uh, that's 16 millimeters. So these are big enough that you'll notice if you're rolling like 10 of them at once, it'll be kind of difficult to do it. But if you're just rolling like five or six of them at once, it's, it's fine. They'll still fit in your hand just fine. The next solution, backgammon dice. Backgammon dice are extremely expensive. Um, the cheapest legitimate example I could find was $26 for two of them. Now, the cool thing about backgammon dice is that they are perfectly rounded, perfectly balanced the way casino dice are, but they have rounded corners, which requires an absolutely maniacal attention to detail because they are spinning around more. So any flaw that would be in the dice is of course gonna be magnified because of those rounded corners. And so to create a perfectly balanced dice that has that requires just extremely precise machining. It's, um, it's very difficult to do, and that's why they're so expensive. However, if you care, and you're willing to pay $13 a dice, backgammon dice are out there, they are the standard 16 millimeters, and you can get them. And a lot of people like rounded corners because, you know, seeing them bounce all around the board is fun, right? It's dynamic, it's cool. And so backgammon dice will be good for that if that's what you're into. There are other solutions out there, and this is where I remind people that I am not being paid by any of these. These were just places I found on the internet. The first being Paladin Role-Playing. Um, they make polymer dice. It's actually pretty tough to find sets of D6s that are not pipped, that are engraved, um, that are numbered. Most of the time when you find numbered D6s, they're in, in, in a uh, Dungeons & Dragons set of seven different types of dice. Uh, so getting a set of D6s that are high quality this way is, is kind of tough. Again, the numbers instead of pips, that reduces the um, percentage change of heaviness between the one and the six, right? Uh, this one, this, sorry, this six side does not have six times as much stuff gouged out of it as this one side does. It still has significantly more, right? But it's more like three times as much, two times as much, um, significantly less um, difference between the sides. And so that's going to improve the balance. These also have fairly crisp edges, right? You've seen um, examples of rounded edge dice here. These dice are fairly crisp. Now, I don't know ex exactly Paladin's um, process. This crispness may indicate kind of minimal tumbling it may indicate no tumbling and they just have kind of a soft mold it's difficult to say um the edges are not razor sharp but they will arrest the dice momentum just much 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 more effectively than the standard round edge dice and that is of course the biggest factor in creating more randomness in your um in your experience the other cool thing is they come in a ton of colors. So who wants boring backgammon dice when you can have just like tons of sweet colors and marbling? Um, now, if you're really maniacal about it, you do want to get transparent dice, which these are not. Transparent dice will show you if there's a flaw. And so then you'll be able to avoid that one. Um, these are not transparent, so you won't be able to see if there's an issue. But um, Paladin, what actually drew me to them, and the main reason I'm showcasing them here is that they have actual quality control. They test every batch of dice to make sure they come out well balanced, will roll fairly. Um, I didn't try my luck at actually asking. Certainly if I were them, I would not tell me what, what the uh, 
what the test is. Um, but the fact that they have any quality control at all, the fact that they do test these dice at all, is uh, extremely promising. There's also the fact that $10 for eight of them is super cheap. Um, these were by far the cheapest dice I could find that were built um, with fairness in mind, right? Uh, there's obviously much, much, much cheaper dice out there. Um, a buck 25 or whatever it is here for like per dice is a lot more than what you'll pay at a lot of places. But the fact that these have been built with fairness in mind and they're that cheap is honestly astounding. So I did buy eight of them. Um, Paladin also makes some nice wood and metal dice as well. Uh, $6 metal dice, $10 wood dice, uh, if you're interested in the, kind of the more upmarket things. Another good solution, um, a company I found and was really impressed with was Norse Foundry. Um, so first, they have a huge variety of bespoke dice in every material. I've got uh, ceramic clay dice here. Uh, there's rose quartz, or this is, this is amethyst, but there are gemstone dice. Um, they've got every different sort of material. They've got some glass dice that I didn't show here that are absolutely gorgeous. Um, but the main thing that really drew me to them is they're very upfront about how random each dice is. Uh, some of the metal dice say, like, these have been machined to the utmost precision to be perfectly random. But some of their stone dice are just like, hey, man, we carved these, we sandblasted them, they're beautiful, but, like, natural flaws are here, they're going to occur. These are not going to be, like, they're not going to hold the test of a thousand rolls, right? Um, but most of their dice have very crisp corners, so they're still going to be much higher quality than any round-edged dice. Um, most of their metal dice are cast metal. Now, cast metal isn't going to be perfect, right? So there's this uh, one with the cool snowflake symbol here that uh, I really like. I picked up one of these. Um, it's not going to be perfect, right? These sides are not exactly the same. Um, but again, it's going to be a lot better than tumbled plastic. And uh, a lot of the time, because the cast metal is so dense on the inside, the sort of changes on the, on the edges here are a smaller percentage of the total dice weight. Uh, they also just look really sweet. I should notice, note, though, that this like aluminum dice that they've got here, uh, this was one of the ones that they said had been like machined to the utmost highest standard. So they do have dice that are sort of um, built to be extremely perfect. But for example, this cast metal dice, this is going to be so close to perfectly random in terms of, at least in theory, right? Unless there's something wrong with their cast, um, which you would probably find out pretty quickly when you were rolling it. Um, that, you know, once again, these have the, the numbered edges so that you don't have as big a delta in terms of the, the sides. Um, this is going to be pretty good. The one issue with, uh, these cast metal dice, especially the ones with sharp corners, uh, they require a rolling mat, just like casino dice do. The, the difference is you're not doing it to protect the die. You're doing it to protect your table, which will get pretty beat up from, um, <laughs> from these metal dice bonking into the wood. So get a rolling mat for these um, to protect your table. But otherwise, I think uh, there's a lot of dice that you can get here at North Foundry that are going to be really, really random and really beautiful. And that's really solid to have. Gravity Dice. This is the company that was tested in the X-Wing thing that had a perfect four out of four of them were perfectly fair. Um, they just have this maniacal machining process. They drill every pip at a different depth so that every face weighs exactly the same. So the one is drilled six times deeper than the six, the number six pips are to make sure that the one face is the same weight <laughs> as the six face, which I think is wild. Um, they also are confident enough in their perfect balance that like backgammon dice, these guys actually have beveled their edges slightly to make them a little easier to roll, to make them beat up tables a little bit less. They also make it so that if you're perfectly, perfectly, perfectly careful, you can balance them on the beveled edge. Um, but what it does is it makes them, they still are perfectly balanced, right? They've been tested, but they've got those beveled ed edges so they roll a little better. So if you're willing to um, spend a ton of money on dice, uh, 
and you want them to roll more naturally like rounded edge dice but still be perfectly balanced uh, these actually cost the same as backgammon dice they're thirteen dollars per per one um, and that those edges will help alleviate lazy rolls one thing about sharp edge dice is if you're very lazy with them and you just kind of drop them out of your hand uh, people might accuse you of cheating if they don't tumble on the ground at all because um, they're just basically dropping on a face. So you have to make sure when you th throw sharp edge dice that you're kind of tumbling them in your hand. I've certainly seen people, um, especially gamers, will get frustrated at people taking time by like tumbling the dice around in their hand and being like, well, you're not really changing the randomness. Uh, actually, it hugely changes the randomness. And in sharp edge, actually random fair dice you get more randomness from the roll in your hand than you do from when they hit the table, right? So you really don't want to just be dropping them on the table because they might they might not roll at all. Um, they might just like stay on the side if they land perfectly, or they'll just roll like two or three times instead of like a whole bunch of times. So it's really important to like toss them around in your hand a little bit, like put your hands together, do a little of this, do a little of that. You know, most gamers like that anyway. So then, uh, and then toss them on the ground and um, let them roll. So basically, gravity dice, if you're a little too lazy to do a ton of that, uh, gravity dice are going to be good for you because uh, they alleviate that by having those beveled edges, which is really great. Um, I also think that they look really good. One last <laughs> pretty good solution is to just go and make your own. So Nano Labs. Um, and there's a few others as well. They make pre-made dice molds. So if you're feeling really brave, if you want to try mixing your own resin, stuff like that, uh, there are multiple step-by-step -step guides on YouTube for how to do that. Uh, I'll link one of them down below. Uh, you can find folks with a ton of variety of both different molds to try yourself or people who are clearly do the, doing this from molds and making very fancy handmade dice. Uh, if you saw some of the really fancy looking dice I showed at the beginning, the space themed one, the flower themed one, those are like incredibly bespoke die makers kind of pressing stickers or pressing shapes into their die. Um, you can absolutely do that and it can, it can create dice that are really beautiful. Um, and these molds are how you can do it yourself, basically. Uh, most of the molds are cre to create D&D &D sets. D&D uh, &D is a much more popular game than any of the games that require rolling a whole host of D6s. But you can still do that. You can still roll all these D6s and it'll be great. Now, just know, homemade dice, they're never going to be perfectly random, right? We don't know that much about the quality control of these molds. However, um, again, sharp-edged resin cast dice are always going maybe not always but like in general more than just in general soft edge tumbled dice are really really skewed um resin cast dice are going to be much much more random than any kind of soft edge tumbled dice so any of the really fancy dice that i've kind of shown in this video that you can find online um those are all gonna be significantly, if they have these crisp edges, they're all gonna be significantly more random than uh, the low quality tumbled dice, right? Um, you know, so rolling in a set of six, you're just gonna get much better randomness than say the starter set dice that come with your Warcry stuff, um, that come with a lot of board games, for example, all of those things. Um, these are gonna be a huge improvement over those and you can make them look real fancy. Um, and just so you know, the podcast, uh, my buddies at Tabletop and Beyond, they are going to be coming out with some sharp-edged resin cast D6s of their own. So, uh, you know, keep your eye out for that. Depending on how uh, their experience with it goes, I might try my own hand at it and make some uh, dice that are specifically for this channel. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. We'll, we'll give that a try. So uh, that's all I got. That's my my massive study on dice. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. This, uh, this took a bit of effort. Um, so I will be back with more sort of Warcry specific stuff in the future. Um, but until then, may all your roles or at least a randomly acceptable number of your roles be grits. <laughs>